If you follow me, you know I'm learning Rust. This, however, is not the learning Rust video of me banging my head against the wall. That will come later, although side note, I am really enjoying Rust right now, doing Advent and Code. But naturally, as I learn this new programming language, I can't help but make comparisons to the programming language I know best, Java. And Rust is a whole lot different. And what I found is Rust actually has some really nice aspects to it. But it also has a couple things that I'm not really a fan of. Coming from Java, the first thing that stuck out to me is Rust approaches programming quite a bit differently. For example, where the heck are my objects? <laughs> Java is all about objects and inheritance, object-oriented programming. Rust, on the other hand, is built around ownership and traits. And the idea of Rust ownership, right, is that every piece of data has exactly one owner. And when that owner goes away, it gets cleaned up. This is why there's no garbage collector. This is what I mean. And don't make fun of my code. I'm, I'm learning, okay? But let's take this for example. Let levels vector string line split white space collect. So we are going to say let levels copy equal levels. So now what we're doing is we're given the data from levels to levels copy. In any other language, this will still work. It just uses this levels right here. But since this data can only have one owner. That new owner is levels copy. So what should happen is, I hope it'll happen, cargo run, and it's gonna yell at me. And it's yelling at me probably everywhere I use levels, you see? But if I were to come in here and just remove just that line, and I rerun it, we're good to go. Because levels no longer exists. The data that was in levels still exists, but it's levels copy. Levels is, it's just gone. It got cleaned up. And actually, let me not just uh, gloss over the compiler. Look at how beautiful uh, all of the error messages that it gives us. It tells us exactly what is wrong. No more uh, syntax error on line 42. Good luck. <laughs> but it's, it, it, it tells us in this warning that we have an unused variable levels copy. If this is intentional, then prefix it with an underscore like this. Like it doesn't just tell us what is wrong. It tells us why it's wrong in how to fix it. And then the one that I was pointing out before is that borrow of moved value levels. See, we're trying to use levels down here after it is moved right here, as it says. And then it says, consider cloning the value if the performance cost is acceptable with dot clone. This in and of itself is worth its weight in gold. The thing is with ownership, it, at first, it felt very restrictive. Like, let me use my variables the way I want. I'm used to passing objects around however I want and then just having the garbage collector deal with it later. But uh, I guess I can see how that's not as efficient. I mean, that's one part of my brain talking, but then the other part is like, why am I doing the garbage collector's job? Uh, in Java, we have something to take care of. It's the garbage collector, but in Rust, like a big selling point is memory safety, right? If I'm the one doing it, <laughs> the memory can't be that safe. But then I realized it's not about cleaning up. It's about preventing the mess in the first place. I actually made a tweet about the, uh, an ex post about this or <laughs> something similar. I said, uh, I truly am a Java dev. I leave all of my coffee mugs on my extra desk and then take them all out at once at the end of the week. That's garbage collection. Whereas if I was a true Rust dev, then as soon as I finished drinking my coffee, I'd go clean it up. Or not even. Java is like, if my wife were to come in and take care of all of the coffee mugs, like I don't even have to worry about it. But it would still sit there all week. See, that's the difference. Rust makes us plan ahead every piece of data, where it lives, who gets to use it, and for how long, from the start. But Rust does have some exceptions to ownership, kinda. I don't know if I'd call them exceptions, but what I'm thinking of is, at least initially, is borrowing. And I guess cloning, right? But that's just the same data stored in two different variables. It's a way around it. As long as performance cost is, is acceptable, as our compiler says. And borrowing, instead of um, wait, transferring ownership of this data from levels to levels copy, we can have a little ampersand right here. And now we are borrowing that data. Levels copy is borrowing the data from levels, or, or should I say it's borrowing a reference to the data. We're just referencing that data whenever we use levels copy, which that's exactly how it works in Java. So like we don't need the ampersand in Java. Something like this would be 
referencing the vector, the same vector in memory as levels. So if we have levels copy, or if we were to do something with levels down here, and then we were to call levels copy, doesn't matter which one you use to change that data, the other one will reflect it because it's the same vector in memory. So references is actually the default in Java. So if we were to just save, the only thing that we should get is that we are not using levels copy. Yeah, all of these went away because even though it's all the same code, the only thing we added was this little ampersand right here. We are still able to use levels anywhere else in the code because the value was not moved. And these references here, we can actually have as many as we want, right? We can have as many as we want, as many references as we want, as long as they are immutable. But if this were mutable, then we could only have one reference to the data. And if your brain works like mine, you're kind of thinking, well, what's the point? Why? Why do we do this? Like, why, why is it so particular about how we use these variables? Well, it's because it wants to catch everything at compile time. Rust does it like this because it prevents data races at compile time. And you don't have to worry about thread safety or synchronization because if your code compiles, then it is thread safe. But how exactly is this being enforced? The ownership, the borrowing, the borrow checker. It's like having a really strict boss who's on your case every single time you do something wrong. It could be annoying. Yes, very annoying. But unlike your boss, the borrow checker has an actual reason. Like when I try to use data that might not exist anymore or trying to modify data that something else is using. Like this, for example, ignore all the other code around it. This is kind of like its own little example, but it helps me understand it. That's kind of why I'm making this whole entire video to help me figure out how to explain these concepts so that you understand it because it helps me understand it. And it helps you understand my understanding of it. So if you actually know what you're talking about, you can correct me. So this, as we discussed, is referencing that data up here. So data would still work. And then down here, we are trying to modify it while it is being borrowed. And if we were to print this out, what exactly would happen is the borrow checker says no. And as you can see, we have cannot borrow data as mutable because it is also borrowed as immutable because you cannot have both at the same time. In Java, this type of thing would be a concurrency modification exception, or at least it could lead to that at runtime. But in Rust, it won't even compile, which is a good thing. <laughs> you may feel like you're never getting anything done because you can never compile the code, but all of this will help you get to a point where you have actual good code that will compile. It's worth it. It's worth, it's worth having the strict boss over your head telling you exactly how things need to get done. That's the thing about Rust. It's like it micromanages you. <laughs> I feel like that's a really good way to look at it. But here's the thing about, so Russ ownership tells us Russ doesn't like sharing. Every piece of data has exactly one owner. But then they have this thing called traits, where traits have um, shared behavior, or it, it, it's a way of defining shared behavior. However, the thing with traits is somebody coming from interfaces in Java, for some reason it, it messes with my head. Like I see, I, I see traits. I kind of understand traits, but my mind reverts back to its normal state. It's weird because I mean, they're both contracts, right? They both define methods that a type should have or lay out required methods, but supposedly traits are more powerful. And I see how they could be more flexible with the orphan rules, which is a hell of a name, but you can, <laughs> but that's because you can implement traits for types you didn't define. Whereas with interfaces, it's only the classes you own, implemented for your own classes. And I even did some reading between um, Haskell style type classes versus OOP interfaces. And, and I know that Rust isn't OOP. I know it's not. So I understand that difference between traits and interfaces. What I'm trying to say is that I, I see the things that traits are capable of, but I don't have like the understanding of it. I'm not happy with my current understanding of traits. I need to learn more. I mean, even same with ownership. Like I understand it and I can even use it, but I need to use it more so I can really get used to it. Cause getting used to it is a whole other thing. Oh, and uh, supposedly null checks aren't a thing or no pointer exceptions because um, null isn't a thing with Rust. Like, how does that even work? Rust is like, eh, man, we're not gonna do anything with null. I mean, like, it's, we're just gonna, dare I say, null is null in Rust. <laughs> Sorry. But Rust does have this thing called an option, which is 
how they how they did this because I was very curious about this. So option, it it's Rust, you know, being that strict boss. Let's say strict parent, it, forcing you to handle a case where something might not exist. This is my understanding of it, right? All of this right here and a little bit off the screen. And so in Java, this this might be null, right? So we address it like if name is not null, then print out name or do whatever you want with name. Whereas in Rust, we have the option, and this says that it may or may not exist. And we could do the if let, which is if name has a value, let's call the name, if not, then don't run it. And I guess if we wanted to be more similar to this, we could do an else, like if it doesn't have a value, then we can say no name provided, or you can have match, which match is like switch. So instead of doing this is what I'm saying, we do match, which in this example, may not, it, it may not seem beneficial, but obviously with a switch statement or a match statement, I mean, there are obvious use cases for it for particularly more than just this, unless you want if else, if else, if else, if else, if else, if else, if else you see what I'm saying? But the match, the way I understand is that you have to address every possible case, like if there is some name or if there is none. When I know there's more to it and things of that nature, but I haven't used it in anything. I haven't used it really that much at all. I think maybe I've used it once. Or in other words, I just, I don't have the full picture. I need to see it in something a little bit more advanced to really get the full understanding, but in due time. Oh, and since we're talking about options, there's also the result type, right? So instead of throwing exceptions, we have to explicitly handle success and failure. Oh, and then I know I've mentioned this a little bit, but obviously um, variables are immutable by default. You know, in Java, you have to make final this, final that. You have to specify what you want immutable. But here it is immutable by default and you have to specify whether or not you want to be able to change it. And we're supposed to make everything final that can be final, but devs are lazy. And Rust must know this, which is why they say, okay, everything's immutable. And if you try to change it, we're going to tell you to make it mutable or do something else. You have to explicitly make it mutable. Which I think is a very, oh, you can't even see that anymore, which I think is a very good idea. And then there's good old cargo. If you saw the, you know, I'm typing in cargo run. I am using cargo, even though I have no dependencies. So all it's really doing is, well, simplifying my process, I'll say. So I don't have to build it and then run it. I just do cargo run, which compiles and runs in just that single command. But cargo, so in Java, we have, you know, Maven and Gradle, which are fine. They do the job. And while I haven't used cargo and rust in any sort of big project, so I could be jumping the gun on this a little bit, cargo just feels cleaner, like, better, more intentional. That seems to be the common theme here with rust and its ecosystem. It, it is very intentional because cargo is just like, uh, here's how you build stuff. Here's how you manage dependencies. Uh, okay. Speaking of which dependency management, <laughs> Let's compare the XML file to the TOML file. The XML file seems like it was written by bureaucrats by a committee in the basement of a government building. You know what I mean? A whole lot of fluff. Whereas the TOML file, well, enough said. And look, I know it sounds like I am uh, glazing rust, and I hate that term particularly because uh, you can give people flowers. It's okay, but every time you want to give somebody flowers, somebody else says that you're glazing them. Like it's okay to to, to appreciate a thing or a person. Just just a side note there. But when it comes to Rust, Rust isn't perfect. I mean, there are definitely some some things that I miss coming from Java. And obviously, this is a whole new like programming paradigm, if you will, that I have to get used to. So, but I don't see that as a negative. I just see that as something different. I mean. The fact of the matter is learning a completely different way of programming, of going about it, I'm actually quite enjoying. And I also think I'm enjoying it because I see the reason Rust does it. If it was just different for being different sake, then maybe not so much, but because I see why, I do really like that. So overall, yeah, I'm actually really liking Rust. But you know what's funny about this is that if I were to try this when I was younger, I wouldn't like Rust. It's like I'm having an epiphany while learning Rust, which is the last thing I thought would happen. And bear with me, because I'm, I'm going from Java to Rust, right? That progression is 
the same progression I've made through life. When I was young and immature, I wanted to do things my way. I didn't want to be told what to do by my parents or my teachers or my boss. I didn't want to listen to them. I, and don't get me wrong, I still don't want to be told what to do necessarily, but I see the value in others' experience now that I'm a, a little bit more mature. And I'm also, you know, I'm also a parent. I have two kids and I, I can already tell that they're going to be knuckleheads just like me when I try to give them advice on something I've done a thousand times, but they've got to figure it out on their own. It's like, uh, don't touch the stove. You can tell somebody not to touch the stove. This is a, an analogy, by the way. You tell somebody don't touch the stove a million times, but they're not really going to learn that lesson until they're the ones that touch that stove. And that's how I went through life. It's like, I have to experience these things. Java is the younger me, whereas Rust is me now. More structured, more intentional, not just going through life trying things out willy-nilly. I have things that I need to get done, just like Rust forces you to address everything. I don't know if that makes complete sense to y'all. It, it makes sense in my head. Let me say it this way, actually. When you're young, you're young, wild, and free. But at what cost? There's a risk to that. We've all done things when we we're younger, dumb things that we would never do today because we know better. In Java, that's runtime errors in the form of null pointer exceptions and race conditions, unpredictable pauses from the garbage collector because we didn't explicitly address memory management, nor did we address thread safety. However, Rust forces us to address these things like a strict teacher, a strict boss, a strict parent, with the compiler being the enforcer to ensure that you follow the rules. That's the word I'd give Rust, strict and intentional. I sure didn't, I sure didn't think learning Rust was going to give me a life lesson or realization, but here we are, pretty cool if you ask me. And look, I'm still learning Rust. Uh, the ownership model, the trait system, the fearless concurrency as they call it. So, I mean, if you're a, a Rust dev who, who who actually actually knows Rust um, and you have any knowledge for me, advice for me, or I have some misconceptions about the language, I'm here to learn, let me know. That's why I made this entire video because it allowed me to put my my understandings to paper, to words, so I can try to explain concepts, figure out how to explain concepts to you, which helps solidify them in my brain. Yeah. And if, if you want to see the actual, you know, me learning Rust process, my Rust journey, that video will be the next or the one after of uh, about a, a, a week's worth of Rust learning, maybe, you know, three to four hours a day. But it's a lot of footage to go through and a lot of it to boil down into a manageable video that isn't 20 hours long. So if you do want to see that, make sure you subscribe, hit the notification bell. I'm also looking maybe in a month or two to try out Kotlin, but we'll see. In the meantime, I'll be sticking with Rust. Oh yeah, one more thing, in Rust, you just use the vec macro when initializing with data, right? But the vec new when empty, is that right? I feel like I've been using nothing but vectors in Advent of Code. I don't know if it's correct or not, but I have. Not to be confused with mathematical vectors, of course, like the ones I've been studying in Brilliant's Linear Algebra course, with Brilliant being the sponsor of today's video. If you want to learn STEM, whether it be programming, computer science, data analysis, math science, or all of the above, Brilliant's interactive lessons are such a good way to do it. And they have something for everyone. If you're just starting out programming, try these programming courses like Thinking in Code and Programming with Python. If you're already experienced, well, there's always more to learn, maybe a different topic. What I do is I, I just do a little bit every day, just a few minutes, because it's fun and I get to learn. And the thing is, it's not just throwing knowledge or syntax at me. It's giving me a problem that I need to break down, think through, and figure out the solution step by step. That's why I enjoyed Advent of Code so much. It gives you a problem to solve and makes you solve it so you're actually learning. Because that's the only way to learn, you solving the problem yourself. If you haven't checked out Brilliant already, I highly recommend you do. It's it's awesome. And if you use my link, brilliant.org slash farsnight, or scan the QR code on the screen, you get the first 30 days completely free. And if you decide to get an annual premium subscription, you'll get 20% off of that.